December 5th is the Kenneth Cole Day of Purpose. In recognition of the brand's 40-year anniversary, 100% of sales at kennethcole.com will be donated to vital mental health efforts. So, shop on December 5th at kennethcole.com to help spread more love in the world. Shut the hate up and change the way we perceive and talk about our collective well-being. The Kenneth Cole Day of Purpose, December 5th at kennethcole.com. Sponsored by Shopping Gives. Hey, pull up a chair. It's Hacks on Tap with David Axelrod, Robert Gibbs, and Mike Murphy. I've got a whole team of zoologists searching the world for the only... Uh, in Eastern Europe, there were some illegal experiments, and I might have found one, a 300-pound crow for you to eat when Trump loses the Iowa caucus. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that was from like a long That's a time, time ago. Tunnel. Not that, that was long, from a, Mike ahead. Murphy. That w- I know you recognize the voice. Yes, that was you. That is not a deep fake. That's not AI. That's Mike Murphy from last spring, I think. Uh, and I am prepared. I've cleared a spot on my table for the three hundred pound crow, but I'm not <laughs> convinced. I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to. Yeah, eat we're it. not roasting one quite yet quite yet, but it's following the pattern as our terrific guest, the incomparable author, Bon Vivant, Los Angelino now by Transit and New York Times multi-decade superstar, Mr. Adam McGurney is here, author of The Times, How the Newspaper of Records Survived Scandals, Scorn, and the Transformation of Journalism. And we want to talk about that, and we're going to talk about that. But Adam's also here, not just because he's written a terrific book, but because he's really one of the great political writers of of, uh, of our time. And uh, so we're trying to figure out one of the most unusual elections of our time, Adam. So uh, we're, uh, we're calling on you to bring the, your years of decades, <laughs> centuries decades. of perspective. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, <laughs> we all met you. Axe and I go back so far in this that I remember when you were a, a, an ink-stained wretch for USA Today. Yeah. And then, then you had a meteoric, a meteoric career. And then, of course, the New York Times, where you were pestering us with hostile questions all the time uh, on various campaigns we both did. And you can help us on Wine, the Great Mystery, which, of course, my uh, podcasting partner here alluded to at the beginning, <laughs> which is my prediction. And I, I will argue it could be coming true that Trump would have a tougher primary. Now, I know, and, uh, you know, my dear beloved friend David, the, the to- as the, uh, my brother were out there, toiling slave to the conventional interests, uh, is convinced <laughs> that the, the high polling right now, especially national polling, Trump will power right through. And that's not a dumb bet. But I've been saying for over a year, I think he, somebody may emerge and give him a race in Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina. And it's clearly somebody is emerging. We just don't know if they're going to emerge enough. And that's Nikki Haley. We will do a, f- yeah, we're a fuller about review of what you've been saying for a year uh, after the <laughs> Iowa caucuses. But yeah, but, clearly somebody's been working on a little tape collection with our former <laughs> engineer, Jeff Fox, who's under strict instructions to burn all that crap. <laughs> so, Fox, you and I have some you've got some explaining to do later. Listen, one but, of us uh, is one of us is going to. Yeah, it's going to be crow time. One Although I'm the one out it. on a limb. You're there with the thundering herd. You know, I'm, I'm, listen, I'm a rare I beacon be of insight. There. I I would love to be out there on a limb with you. Nagurney, uh, how much of a limb do you think Mike is out on here? I mean, what do you think the chances of Trump being upended? See, he's trying uh, to pull you here. into the swamp to have to eat crow yeah. after uh, the New Hampshire and, and South Carolina primaries. We're recording you too, by the way. But yeah. Go ahead. I know, I know. It's a pretty big limb, but you know— we have all seen Iowa go against what it appears yeah. to be doing. We're still in November yeah. or December here. You know, I think it was at this time in 20, 2004 that Howard Dean was going to win the Democratic uh, caucus out there. So we know that Iowa could surprise. That said, you know, Trump is pretty far ahead and uh, there's a lot of support for him. And I think the only one who I think the only one who could take him is Nikki Haley. So it's not impossible. Mike, 
it's possible Mike might not have to eat crow or David won't have to which one of you are eating crow. We, we might share a crow when Vivek Ramad, Whamad, Mamad, Ding Dong or whatever it is <laughs> surges to the front. I, I think, are we going to do Iowa now? Should we just get through it? And then, because that's the question. Yeah, no, Can I Nikki do, get I do second talk about or it. is DeSantis going to be the spoiler there to take her momentum away into the killing fields of New Hampshire? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's certainly possible. I mean, the person I've been watching all along was Nikki Haley. I mean, I think, I mean, whether, she, I think she would certainly be a really powerful general election candidate, whether she yes. can survive in a Republican, excuse me, a Trump dominated Republican world. Not as sure, but it's certainly possible. The paradox, of course, is the, the reason she'd be a strong general election candidate makes her uh, a kind of a iffy candidate in exactly a Trump right. dominated Republican party. I mean, she, you know, it, she eats with a fork and knife and therefore has the ability <laughs> to uh, appeal to a broader. <laughs> Uh, uh, unless electric. she's in front of the knife and fork haters club, then she'll go right to the <laughs> fingers. Because I've never been a huge fan, but to beat Trump, <laughs> I'm literally trying to force my hand to write her a check right now, which isn't easy. But I'm all for her against Trump. And David is exactly right. It's the, She would break the suicide pact the Republican Party has taken with itself. But that is a hard bond to break these days. You know, your point, uh, Mike, I was uh, thinking about this because we've talked about this a lot that, you know, she's a very, very talented talented politician and we've seen that in these debates but uh, uh but she tends to slice the salami a little thin you know and try and have it always with with all people and I, i'm looking for this headline there was a headline the other day that reminded me of this and it was basically you know Haley. here this may be a it's basically she's trying to appeal to all elements of the Republican Party. Yeah. And that is that is an almost that's like a game of twister, you know. <laughs> no, the Secret Service code name is too clever by half. Yeah. Um uh TCBH. Uh so it's a problem and what comes with the surge as predicted uh is scrutiny. Yes. And that's the enemy of the surge. But but I think tactically Governor Kim Reynolds of Iowa who who's not a big strong, you know, she says something the state jumps and I don't think endorsements at the presidential level. This isn't a county commissioner race make all the difference, but she put a little life into DeSantis. And so now Haley and DeSantis are killing each other on the air. Haley in a reversal of things has more money and more bullets. Uh, and there's some news, uh, David, maybe you're mentioned that that buttress yeah. that today. But if Haley gets knocked into third place, uh, DeSantis Iowa. also having gotten a pretty big endorsement by one of the Christian warlords there, um, that that will stem the momentum. She needs to really fracture Trump in South Carolina and then try to finish him off in her home state of South Carolina. Now, that said, the other endorsement and. Hat tip to our longtime listener and Iowa friend, David Kochel, great old hack out there. Yeah. Uh, Marlis Popma. Does that ring a bell, Adam? Way back yeah, in your Iowa. David does, but Marlis doesn't. Who? Yeah. <laughs> probably I knew David the well. career best pro life, but, but, strategic uh, okay. grassroots activist in Iowa over the last five election cycles. Walked into a Haley meeting last week or maybe the week before Thanksgiving and stood up and said, I was undecided. I'm with her. That's an interesting indicator. So, you know, we're see. She really, you know, in terms of what David would say before, in terms of her, if she is twisting herself into knots, I was really fascinated by her abortion rights response to the last debate, which I thought was really nuanced and seemed to me to be a road for Republicans to navigate this issue i didn't know how it would play with the republican party right, right. sort of like, like the still states don't. do it right we still don't so that's what you're telling me now is really Iowa will be a good test can she peel enough Iowa will be to test. get the yeah. second so yeah. it's for her mar mar or less mar or less is that what you're marlis saying? popma <laughs> legendary operative there on the other hand bob vander Plaats, who's a pretty prominent right. he's a christian warlord i spoke about right I, yeah yeah, yeah so endorsed uh DeSantis. So, you know, here here's the, my question about Iowa, you guys. Um, having spent a lot of time there, having been involved in a lot of uh, uh, campaigns there, Murphy, you missed some of those because McCain skipped, skipped it. it. And uh, but uh, organization yeah. really does matter in a caucus. It really does. And uh, m everybody tells me that uh, you know Haley has some momentum in terms of uh, you know her notoriety and 
people paying attention. Uh, she has very little organization on the ground, very little organization. And the one thing that the DeSantis people, particularly their super PAC that's, uh, uh, is spending, uh, you know, a great deal of money on is organization. And, uh, so that plus Reynolds, it seems to me, gives him an edge. And I don't know that you can just on the basis of buzz make up. We would not, for example, Obama would not have won the Iowa caucuses, uh, despite all the buzz and all the momentum that he had going in, if he didn't also have like a huge ground game in that state. Yeah, though, I, I think there's a lot of conventional wisdom going on there. Oh, it's I'm, I remember being with James Carville and Mary Matlin on Meet the Press back, and I, I had to listen to a long lecture about how, I mean, a nice lecture, because afterward, Carville pulled me aside. Damn, if that guy starts running in Iowa, he'll be the nominee. Because I went out on a limb then, too, and said I thought this crazy, light, accomplished, one-term senator was going to beat Hillary Clinton in Iowa. And oh, no, the Clinton or organization, unstoppable. I mean, I take your point. I've done a lot of caucuses, too. Yeah, but too. we built a better organization. I, I, That's my yeah, point. Yeah, well, you had a better message, too, though. We did. I think you need both. I'm not suggesting yeah, yeah. that uh, if you if, if if you just needed one, then DeSantis could win the caucuses. Yeah, I, I just, Jeff Rowe, and, you know, I've talked to him about it. it they're trying a novel thing, which is, right. Now, they're all in a fist fight. The, the yes. meanest war in Republican parties is between DeSantis and his own uh, super PAC. There was a great uh, NBC news.com story about 10 days ago. I think I retweeted it about this screaming match. We're going to create another super PAC. Um, yes. And I hear that from the inside. It's very bumpy. But they tried to do all the organizational stuff, the super PAC, to save hard dollars for the campaign, which is tough to do. And all the organizational world can't drag an unlikable candidate. Now, I thought the organizational signal, and you mentioned him, and I did before, not by name, is Bob Vanderplatz, yeah. yes. who, by the yeah. way, ran for governor himself and got beat in the primary by you remember Doug Gross, do. uh, a regular Your client, but, yes. Th- yeah, I mean, my dear friend, uh, Branstead's old chief of staff, and by the way, also a Nikki Haley caucuser. Who got beaten in the general, but we'll, that's a story. Yeah, for yeah, day. slimy, underhanded campaign by some goon out of Chicago, but we're, we're talking about that some other time. Uh, uh, avenging an, 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 another race where uh, the attorney general was defeated by a talking cow, a campaign Doug was very involved in. But to, to just land this thing, I think strategically for Nikki, maybe the organization and the governor's endorsement will push DeSantis into second, squelching the real bounce that she could really use into Iowa. I think it's pretty close. I think she was in second a few weeks ago. But the question is, you know, A, will the Governor Reynolds thing help? Two, will the money in surge, surge she's had allow her to outgun? Three, will organizational make it? organizational stuff make a difference now, particularly outside the big metro counties, which are much more like a normal primary. Will any of the 170,000 Dems and or independents who voted Democrat in the last caucus, mm-hmm. Dems and it, we didn't even show up in the caucus. We got a question about that. We could talk about that. Oh, great, great. And later. then finally, the two more debates, including probably the last one in Iowa. W- will it be a right. magic moment for somebody? So anyway, we got a race is all I'm saying. And thank God we do, or we'd be, we'd be the board hacks. Yes, exactly. We should have a board. Let's elect one. But anyway, yeah. the news of the day is that Charles Koch has endorsed uh, Nikki Haley. And that, you know, 10 years ago, that would have sent tremors through the political uh, world. The Koch network isn't the network that it was uh, back then. But it does mean millions of dollars in advertising. And it probably does yeah. mean some organizational resources for her at a time when she Pretty thin, uh, she, but money, yeah, a lot she, of money uh, when, when when she uh, needs it. So, and it's also a signal to other donors that yeah. this is the game. It's another knife in 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 DeSantis. Well, some of those donors, I mean, this this is a wet streets cause rain thing a bit. It, it's good for Nikki because it's money, but a lot of that money had already moved to her. Some of it started with DeSantis, went to Scott. So, uh, but it's helpful. There's no, the, the New York Times, uh, it kind of got it wrong in my view with much love for some of my reporter friends wrote the story that there's a big Coke organization. And it, no, it's a donor party. They meet at five-star resorts, candidates come in and, and pitch them and, but they're not for Trump. And there's real money there. So she's not going to get beat on the air by anybody now between what she'd already done and this in Iowa, New Hampshire, or South Carolina, which it's a good thing to have. 
But Iowa, it's a little late. Isn't it a little late now to start building up an organization if she doesn't have one? Money can't. Yes. I mean, that's yes. what we learned yes. in 2008, yes. right, David? Money can't do yeah. it. Yeah. Yes. It's yes. the mid-sized counties that aren't. Remember, the Republican thing is different than the Democratic thing. It's a closed ballot deal. It's kind of like a big firehouse primary. So you don't have to stand up and talk as much. You don't have your oh, the right. veterinarian right. keeping an eye on you that you want to come to your farm at three in the morning. And he's for Vivek. So to get people there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But culturally, it's a big thing. And it, we're see, part of it could be turnout difference. If you have a good yeah. organization, you might find nine, ten thousand 10,000 right. new people. I mean, yeah. here's the thing. She did the smart thing, which was uh, she understood that her play was New Hampshire. And right. she invested her early money in New Hampshire. Uh, and uh, then, you know, she kind of caught a, some tailwind and decided, I can play in Iowa. And in order to uh, fully realize my potential in New Hampshire, I A, want to knock DeSantis out, and B, I want to get some momentum coming out of Iowa. And so she's invested a lot of money there late. But Adam, you're right. I think it's, it's, it's late to organize, and we'll see what impact that has. But Mike, your point on uh, the fact that, you know, one other thing, either by happenstance or by, you know, you, you know, I always used to say, when you're never as smart as you look when you win, and you're never as dumb as you look when you lose. It may just be dumb luck. But because she is breaking late here, she hasn't really been scrutinized other than by DeSantis ads. Right. She hasn't taken a lot of incoming. The question is, when does the big orange man uh, decide, you know, this thing is getting to be irritating to me and I'm going to start training my guns on her. Yeah, no, they, um, they've got a calculation to make there. Emotionally, he'll want to do it the minute he sees a single digit poll, which well, I think the he is thing may see. drive him that way. Yeah, well, that's a trigger too. I mean, Trump is all about triggers. So I, I think if you're for <laughs> Trump, you're for him. If you're not, you're not. Can she coalesce? The, I believe the majority of primary voters will go another way. It's really a 50-50 thing, and that's where DeSantis is a big problem. Uh, so he's got to go lose, and that makes her a giant killer. So she needs that second in Iowa. And I think she's in the hunt for it, but we're, we're see, We're seeing. And if she finishes third, where does that leave her? I, I think she's I've, – I've had people come out of nowhere to do third and get a pretty good run out of it, but – you know, it's not quite enough. You need the super. I mean, she's trying a very hard thing. She is David and Goliath. She needs to beat Trump. So if she beats DeSantis, she's the killer. She beats Trump. And then she does it again in South Carolina, which is where, one, he's got plenty of strength. And two, the normal New Hampshire upshit candidate runs out of gas. That's the ultimate showdown yeah. is South Carolina. Yeah. Adam, where did George H.W. Bush, didn't he finish third in Iowa Was in uh, 88? I think he did. I think so. I think you're right. There's that old rule. What right? there's, there's three births out of Iowa. Is that that old rule? Or is it yeah, two? so three anyway. tickets out of Iowa, two out of New Hampshire. And traditionally, right. there's been some truth into that. But I do think that Nikki Haley wouldn't really need to come in second. Maybe she can come in first, second to really be in a strong position to take it to the end. Maybe win in New Hampshire. I don't know. It's certainly in South Carolina. Yeah. But you know, New, I mean, Iowa is not what I would call predictive, right? It's it, uh, I love Iowa. No, it's, it's not. A great President place to Santorum, uh, exactly. Uh, President Huckabee. Exactly. Exactly. Republic, so Huckabee, yeah, it right? Ten, yeah. tends, it, it basically decides losers more than winners. It's going to weed a bunch of people out. Right. President Cruz, who beat Trump. Yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, so just to finish this on this point, I wonder when the ads are coming or the Trump uh, social media posts and so on about uh, Haley's comments a couple of years ago when she said she would never challenge Trump because that that you know there there's a there's a locker of a treasure trove of these kind of conflicting statements that go to the point that we were all making earlier which is you know she she tends to play it a bit too cute and uh this and and flip flop on things. So I wonder if that maybe this will maybe Trump's agent uh, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, which is the correct pronunciation, uh, will uh, take this matter up in the next debate. I hope he does because I think it sets her up. But go ahead, Adam. I think she no, can reply say, if you guys brilliantly. Were doing ads in Iowa. Would you, I mean, wouldn't you wait till right after Christmas to come in with this, or what do you think? Is it, would you do it now? Well, I mean, it's DeSantis who could, who will probably, uh, who, who, who could do it as well. Okay. No, I mean, I listen. I would not. I'm not sure that I would wait. The the 
the caucuses okay. are on the 15th of January. Right. So uh, there's yeah. not a whole I, lot I would of jam time. up Christmas. I'm with David. You do I'd now? do it early. Okay. But, but here's the risk. Haley yeah. is an adroit performer, and she'll say, look, right, she is. anybody think we have the same Trump now we had in 2016? He's older. He's You know, and you, you just yeah. go with that. Yeah, you know, yeah, I had to change because he's changed for the worst. Now he's the one guy by, you know, you go down the road of what she's running on. I think she'd do fine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe you don't do it in the debate. But I think the lesson, again, of Howard Dean was that switch, that flow around, away from him, I think came in the final weeks of the caucus. It was like yeah, it moves really late. They it land. Moved People were paying attention. And there was yeah. that whole disclosure with his radio interview. So, yes, he, listen. First of all, campaigns do expose you, and Howard right. Dean, there there were questions about how settled he was, and you know the, the Dean, Dean screaming and everything. Settled, but remember, like Howard that. Dean was a <laughs> Howard Dean was sort of a a lightning bolt in this whole deal. He wasn't a known quantity when the campaign began. But uh, then, you've got a front runner in Donald Trump, who, for better and worse, is very well known. Uh-huh. He's a former president. Much harder to overtake a candidate like that than it is uh, the, the the race in Iowa, where really, you know, there was Howard Dean, Wesley Clark, there were, you know, there were, uh, John Kerry, obviously. Um, Kerry was probably the best known of those candidates and ultimately ended up winning. But it was a much more wide open kind of deal uh, than this thing is. So, you know, we'll see. I mean, I've cleared the place for the crow, but we'll see. All right, we're going to leave for a minute to pay the power bill, and then we'll be right back. We all know our moms and our dads love nothing more than when we call them. This holiday season, you can give her a call, of course, and you should. But you can also give her an Aura digital picture frame. Yeah, those are So you have another amazing way to stay in touch. So, Axe, you're our technologist here. Explain what the Aura digital picture frame is and what it does and why it's so cool. Yeah, well, you know, I, this is really important to me because I've got kids and grandkids scattered around the country. I'm always eager to see great pictures of them. And uh, that is what the Aura Frames allows you to do. Aura Frames was named the best digital photo frame by Wirecutter and Fast Company. Said this simple, stylish digital picture frame can replace social media in your life. And God knows we need that. Look, it's the best one. Aura Frames was named, quote, best digital photo frame by Wirecutter. And they don't give it up easily. They're part of the New York Times. And by Fast Company, which said this simple, stylish digital picture frame can replace social social media in your life. So the next time you need to call your mom or dad, you can also send them a new pics of you or the grandkids from that trip or a fun family memory that you're telling her about right from your phone. You do it with a phone app. It pops up on her frame across the country. What great technology. You can add unlimited photos and videos and invite as many people as you want to a frame. There's absolutely no hidden fees or subscriptions. So the whole family can contribute to this frame. It'll be touching and heartwarming and fun. Give the perfect gift this holiday season by visiting Aura Frames, A-U-R-A-F-R-A-M-E-S dot com today and get $30 off their best-selling frames with the code HACKS. These frames sell out quickly, though, so get yours before they're gone. That's Aura, A-U-R-A frames dot com with the promo code HACKS. Terms and conditions apply. Speaking of Trump's social media posts, Mike, uh, it, it was touching to me that the president at two in the morning on Thanksgiving <laughs> Day took the time out to wish us all, and I talk about the former president, to wish us yes. all a happy Thanksgiving with a message. And I know you were eager to share that message with Yeah, it's our, an inspiring moment. Jeff, can yeah. we have some Thanksgiving music, please? This will bring us all together in our divided nation. Donald J. Trump reached out to our country in a moment where we all cherish family and our national history. Happy Thanksgiving to all, including the racist and incompetent Attorney General of New York State, Latina Peekaboo James, who has let murder and violent crime flourish, all caps, and businesses flee, all caps, a radical left 
Trump-hating judge, a, quote, psycho, Arthur and Gorin, who criminally, capital C, defrauded, capital D, the state of New York and, all caps, me, by purposely valuing my <laughs> tremendous assets at a tiny fraction, a fraction of what they're worth in order to convict me of fraud before a trial or seeing any proof, all caps, <laughs> and on and on and on it goes. Stone cold, hold your ears, kids, f***ing crazy. But it does have a positive message at the end, right? Read what he says at the end. Oh, yeah. He he wrapped it up to bring us all together, the, the Democrats and the Justice Department, who allowed our country to go to hell and all the other radical left lunatics, communists, fascists, Marxist Democrats, rhinos, who are seriously looking, all caps, to destroy our country. Have no fear, however. We will win, all caps, the presidential election of 2024, ampersand, the you know, new favorite, <laughs> and all caps, make America great again, and three exclamation points yeah, to make sure so you know he means it. Giving message. Yeah, from, there we go. From, That's so, great. Adam, is there a point when it becomes very when the 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 race is settled and it you know and it's Biden versus Trump uh, and I believe it will be where these kinds of things get more attention and people start focusing on the fact that the guy has become more unhinged than even they recalled and does that or is that just baked in the cake? Yeah, that um, David, I think that's a big question for the Biden people, assuming he gets the nomination, which I do too. Um, I don't think it's baked in the cake. I mean, obviously it's baked in the cake for Trump supporters, but I think this stuff has become background noise for now. When it becomes a true contest between Biden and Trump, again, assuming that's what happens, and Trump gets more out in the public, because he's not getting that much attention now except for the court stuff, I think people start paying attention to this, and I think, you know, this is just speculation, but that's what I do. I think that Independent voters, um, women voters will look at this and go, you know, Biden's kind of old, but do we really want this guy in the White House? So I think that's definitely a, it's not a killer, but it's definitely an issue where it will be a problem. I mean, Mike didn't exaggerate I, the tone of that message, right? That true social no, message. No. I thought I held back out of respect. I, yeah, I thought it was, that's the that Mike was it, and Donald right? Trump sort of have this. They both live inside of each other's heads. So it, <laughs> it, 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 he was well prepared for that, this. I did a tremendous read. Tremendous. The best. Magnificent. Trump is under enormous pressure uh, in these court cases, not just the criminal court cases, but the civil case in yep. New York, which clearly bothers him, uh, which, uh, you know, because it, it could have material it could do material damage to him, but also exposes sort of the fraudulent nature uh, of some of his enterprise or the alleged Wizard of fraudulent. Oz, right? Yeah. So, so he's, you know, he's under a lot of pressure. I think that that is, you know, that is more and more evident in the speeches that he's making, which are becoming more and more, you know, filled with vengeance and sort of not even disguised kind of fascistic language. And so on. I, but I don't think the country is focused on this right now, Mike. Well, I think it's down to Biden. In a normal election, Trump is a, a lunatic who's getting worse. And he's um, he's a general election loser by the normal rules of gravity. The problem is the one bigger thing is fire the incumbent president, which is where the country is right now. And the Biden campaign has a certain amount of time and a very big microphone to try to change that. But they're they're not so good because I think Biden's campaign manager, Joe Biden, uh, <laughs> has a grip on this and is not doing such a good job. I mean, we're back to Bidenomics. You know, let's take my biggest perceived failure and put my name on it. Yeah. You know, it, it was like new improved Murphy COVID. Yeah. You know, it's just I, I'm not seeing them do what they need to do. And I think there are some people that are know what to do. But I have a feeling. Remember, this is a guy. And, and by the way, I'm I will happily and enthusiastically defeat my inner nature and vote for Biden again over Trump. It will not be a, a hard call, you know, and I voted for him last time over Trump. And I think he's done some really good things. So I, I feel for it. But this is a guy who doesn't have tough general elections in his career. He was in Delaware, be the Democrat and win. He's been in a couple of primaries with a mixed result. He, he's not unlike, for good or bad, the Clintons or Obamas of the world. He's not a general election performance oriented politician. He's he's come out of Democrat base politics, so he doesn't have an ear for what he needs to do, I think, to admit people don't want him and he's got to fix that. Let me just I got a couple of clips here that uh, reflect the 
challenge that you're pointing to and the potential opportunity, both from his Bidenomics event that he held yesterday. And I agree with everything you said about like branding a product that people hate. But let's uh, listen to uh, uh, let's listen to the first one, which is him talking about Bidenomics. And then I want to play a second bite that didn't get as much attention from that press conference that I think was actually more more uh, hopeful uh, for the campaign. Because Americans gathered around their own kitchen tables for Thanksgiving dinner. That was our goal, <clears throat> to give them a little more breathing room. And together, we made progress. You know, uh, from Turkey to air travel to tank of gas, costs went down. They went down. Now, to people making a lot of money, that doesn't matter a whole lot because the costs are relatively small compared to wealthy incomes. In fact, as a share of earnings this Thanksgiving, dinner was the fourth cheapest ever on record. I want you all to know that. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> all right. I look at all okay. the Speaking of my horn, speaking to the horn, <laughs> sink the Kaiser. Sink the Kaiser. Fourth cheapest. I want to figure out the person who thought it was a great line <laughs> yeah, to know. say this was the, as a percentage of income, this was the fourth cheapest Thanksgiving <laughs> yeah. You've In heard history. of the gold. You've heard of the bronze. We got the zinc. <laughs> I mean, number four. Who who thinks like that? I don't know. I don't know. I I'd love to put Anita Dunn in a polygraph and ask her, but uh, <laughs> don't have that ability, even with the magnificent power and reach of Hags on Tap. But yeah, that's the problem. They got a problem, and I don't know if they have the tools to fix it. And he might be the campaign problem that he won't let them. I wish that they would get this message. You are not going to win a referendum. People are sour on the economy right now. Uh, trying to brand the economy with your name is uh, is wasting time, and you need to throw this into a hard comparative race as quickly yeah. as you can. Now, listen to this le- next clip because he did do a little of that in the same. In Let the me same just interject setting. quickly before the clip, though. It's even worse than that because the one thing people like about Trump is the economy. So you're playing to Trump's one strength. As well as your own biggest weakness, you're setting up the contrast Trump would love. Like, yeah, he's an asshole, but he could run the economy. But here's a way. That, but this is a uh, – Trump gave them an opportunity uh, over the weekend. You know, I, I have to say, you know, the most uh, the, the, the most frightening moment of uh, the lives of anyone who worked for Donald Trump must be when they wake up in the middle of the night and pick up their phone and see what he's been up to between midnight and six online. Yeah. I think most of them are checking their bank account to see yeah. if they made another buck before this <laughs> so, thing implodes. So, but yeah. But while they're checking their bank account, they see this and, you know, he sent out a clip basically saying, Hey, we're going to go right back at this Obamacare thing, which is like, you know, Waterloo for Republicans. They don't want to go back to, uh, the Obamacare thing. Uh, and the White House white, uh, wisely picked up on that. And this is what Biden had to say. Their plan would also cut Medicare while providing more tax giveaways to the wealthy and the biggest corporations. And my predecessors, once again, God love him, call for cuts that could rip away health insurance for tens of millions of Americans in Medicaid. They just don't give up. But guess what? We won't let these things happen. I mean, I have a larger theory, which is that uh, elections are about the future and you've got two guys who are very old running against each other. And the question is, who whose eye is on the future and who's doing things to try and lay a foundation for the future and who's take us back into this dark sort of cauldron of vengeance. And uh, on every single issue, there are uh, there are contrasts to be drawn, and I wouldn't miss an opportunity to draw contrasts, uh, you know, with Trump on 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 individual issues and on the big issue. Yeah, of, of yeah. Democracy. In the campaign dictionary, we call it offense. Yes, exactly. Not fourth best Thanksgiving ever. So where's my <laughs> award, bastards? Thank me. You owe me, Alias. Don't you think that's got to be Biden driving that? The fourth yes, I do. Yes. Because who, in, who, what scene, I mean, no, with all due respect, what scene political assault would ever say, engage the economy? You're not going to yes. convince people the economy is doing, you're just not going to do it. You can't so talk job about on people else. into feeling what they don't no, feel. No, it is what it is, right? right? And also, as you said, David, like, Obamacare was a, was just a gift, what Trump said over the, whatever that was the other night. 
that was yes. just it. when I saw that, I was like, oh my God. So yeah. I don't know, but forget the economy. Just it's, it's not, you know, it's expensive. Turkeys are expensive. Gas is expensive. Just move on and talk about something else. Right, right. One last thing on Biden. Uh, <laughs> well, speaking of cauldrons of vengeance here, careful. We've, uh, we're, we're, we're trying to pull you out. Is that a great line? <laughs> That's good, Dr. Rod. Okay, then let's take a break right here, and we'll be right back. Murphy, I don't want to insult you. Uh, and <laughs> of I don't, course uh, but you I'm do. Concerned, but I'm concerned about you. You're, you're a little heavy. You're moody. You've got a lot of anxiety lately. And you're not as productive as you used to be. And it makes me wonder, are you getting enough sleep? Yeah, but until your personal insults, I found an answer. Because the experts tell you sleeping less than six to seven hours per night is linked to all the problems you've got. Reduce white blood cell count, bacteria, illnesses, diseases, fighting viruses is detuned. It's not good. No. It's hair loss in there because I'm... Anyway. Oh, that's true. That's true. A tragedy we both bear. So, (laughs) look, here's the bottom line, friends. Sleep is the foundation of our mental and physical health. So, if you want to perform during the day, you want to be healthy, having a consistent nighttime routine, it's just non-negotiable. Introducing Beam Dream. You know they've been sponsoring our show, and we're proud of that. We've been talking about Beam's Dream Powder and their healthy hot cocoa for sleep. I love that idea. And today, our listeners get a special discount on Beam's Dream Powder, their best-selling healthy hot cocoa for sleep and with no added sugar. Now available in delicious seasonal flavors like, wait for it, Murphy, cinnamon, cacao, sea salt (laughs) salt, caramel, and white chocolate peppermint. Better sleep has never tasted better. Look, Dream contains a powerful, all-natural blend of reishi, magnesium, L-theanine, melatonin, and nano CBD to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up refreshed. A recent clinical study revealed Dream helped 93% of users wake up feeling more refreshed, and 93% miraculous reported that Dream helped them get a more restful night's sleep. Just mix Beam Dream into hot water or milk, stir and froth, and enjoy before bedtime. You know the old saying about milk before you go to bed? Try it with Dream Powder for wonderful results. Or with hot water if you're being health conscious. That's true. Find out why Forbes and the New York Times of Adam Nagurney are all talking about Beam and why it's trusted by the world's top athletes and business professionals. If you want to try Beam's best-selling dream powder, take advantage of their biggest sale of the year and get up to 50% off for a limited time when you go to shopbeam.com slash hacks. The discount is auto-applied at checkout, no code necessary. That's shopbeam, B-E-A-M, dot com slash hacks for up to 50% off. Biden was confronted by a Fox reporter over the Thanksgiving holiday. He was up in Nantucket with his family. And I just want you to hear the sequence from the reporter because There are two things to draw from this. The oldest president in U.S. history also continues to face questions about his age, even here in Nantucket. Mr. President, are you too old to be running for (laughs) re-election? All right. So he said that's stupid in response. So first of all, let me I think you said that's stupid by Jiminy, but go ahead. I want to award the Turkey of the Year Award to that Fox reporter because he introduces his his bite by saying, and he, he even here he's being asked about his age, and he was the one who asked it. Yeah. Why, why can't they do the obvious gag <laughs> answer for Biden, which is, look, we're both old, but he's crazy. Well, how about, how about, let's start with don't engage at all or come up with a better answer. Right. But when he says that's stupid, there's like three quarters of Americans, if you believe polling, who think, nah, that's actually a concern. Yeah. And so it makes him look oblivious and contemptuous. Well, cranky, when he says that. which is old, too. I yes, mean, it all yeah, starts, that... he's too old to handle the economy. He's cranky. He's, you know, it just spins into a pit. They need a better answer on this age uh, issue. And like I said, I think, you know, um, uh, uh, 
our my uh, our buddy you may you may know him Saul Shore uh was involved in the race uh Democratic with, Media with Consultant Ed Markey Democratic Media Consultant and they ran an ad but from AOC in a Democratic primary and she said something like it's not the age of the man that matters it's the age of his ideas and it was really an effective she, you know, she, her point was very clear, which is, you know, he's got the he's got the right ideas about where we should go. Um, and I think some variation of that is what Biden has to do here. Uh, and uh, but it's not stupid, Mr. President. This is a concern that 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 people have. You need to overcome that. And uh, you're not going to overcome it by ridiculing. Now, the Fox report deserved scorn. Because Adam Nagurney, you wouldn't tolerate that if you were uh, if you were an editor. I don't know. Would you? I've, Sam Donaldson used to do it, and nobody scorned him. You get to but, yell no, at the candidate when age it, is the biggest. Pre- be, he would precede it by saying, "Even here in Nantucket, he can't escape these questions," and then yeah, shout the that. question. Just Come on, man! Question. That is Just not that is question. that is total BS. So, Nagurney, talk about. Yes, sir. Talk about your book, which, uh, first of all, let's talk do the about title why- again, because it's already run the Pressman Award for the longest and best title of the year. Yes. Is it too long? <laughs> no, it's great. It is an important <laughs> book. OK, not just everybody gets on here to, to plug their book. I mean, okay. come on. Exactly. This thing has a five star rating from Hacks on Tap. Yeah. yeah. Who needs a, who needs the famous prizes? The Times, how the newspaper of record survived scandal, scorn and the transformation of journalism. Adam, when did you start working on this project? So I um, signed the contract in 2016, and I guess I spent six to seven years interviewing people, going through papers and writing. It took a long time. It was a really long time. And David, I've been thinking about it since, I think, 2004 for a long, long time. It's something, that, it's something I've wanted to do there for was, a long time. There was time. a previous book about the Times called The Kingdom and the Power That's uh, right. by, by Gay Talese, who I see blurred <laughs> uh your book how which great is, is that um, <laughs> unbelievable yeah. honor that that which was which was a an amazing book as well um so you were stepping into some big shoes there but yeah the story if you had started writing the story in 2004 it would have been a completely different story than the one you ended up writing because the real story yeah. is what was in that lengthy subhead you kind of summed it up <laughs> which is the time survived where many, many other institutions, uh, new, uh, journalistic institutions have not. Uh, and talk about how how and why that happened. Yeah, so um, w- when I started this book, this is going to answer your question, I had no idea how it would end. Like at that point, it was really possible that the New York Times would not exist by the time I put it in a manuscript or wouldn't exist in the form that we knew. And as it turned out, it figured it out. It figured out how to become a successful organization, news organization in the digital age. And it was a long and painful process that I kind of outlined through the book. There was, it's a very conservative, small C um, newspaper in terms of people, not everybody, and but a tradition. lot of people. Tradition is actually a better word. Yeah, as so a the business, a family business, tradition. That's right. And resisted to change. So there are people, you'll see people in the book who years ago were like, no one's ever going to read the newspaper on a black box. I think an old executive editor said, but there were a couple of people over the years that saw the future. And one of them actually was the main publisher during the main part of the book, Arthur Salzberger Jr., who I think mm-hmm. both of you guys probably met over the years. And he's a former Wire guy. He used to work for the Associated Press. He didn't have the kind of affinity to morning newspapers with deadlines and blah, 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 all that stuff that some of us grew up with. Yeah. So he was like, when a story is done, post it. And the other yeah. thing was... Which was a radical idea back then. I remember right? it was all, well, we're going to sweat this out till tomorrow's news cycle. We have a little breathing <laughs> room here. That's gone. <laughs> There's no breathing room anymore. Huh? There's no breathing room. When you got the story posted, as you guys probably know, that was a hard cultural change in the newspaper. Yeah. Um, the other thing that Salzberger used to say was, he was a Star Trek fan, he used to say is, I don't care. We have to beam the information into their head. We're going to get it to them. And I think that kind That's of stuff set the mindset for the right for the transformation that we see, and you know, there's a lot to write about in this book, but that's that's the big narrative theme, and it has a happy ending in a way. For the times, the question is: for the does, times. It, does yeah. it does it have any? Can you duplicate that strategy, or is it a kind of a unique? Are they in a unique position? So I'm gonna 
I'm going to argue, this is a little bit beyond the end of my book, but I still have opinions. This might not surprise you. I think it's going to be really For the epilogue really and the paperback edition. That's correct, which I'm working on now. Um, <laughs> and I the ice show. Tough. You know, I don't know how many, the ice show is the best part. I yeah. don't know how, I mean, I think, look at the experience of the Washington Post, which is a terrific yeah. world-class yeah. newspaper. Yes, it is. Terrific. Yeah. That is struggling now to sort of, I would say, they might dismiss this kind of formulation to replicate the model in New York Times to show that people will be willing to pay for more than one subscription for a newspaper. I'm not sure that that many people are right. It's right. I, mean, I think that people might get to the people on this, on this podcast might. No, it's like a cable provider streaming. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Multi-channel or let, let me plug something about the book because Please. I want to <laughs> talk to our non-communist listener or two. You know, you're thinking, oh, yeah, this is a history of big left wing rag that's out to get Republicans. This book, one, the granular detail is great. He dipped his knit tie into the coffee and thought about Rwanda. <laughs> you know, it's got it's got microscopic detail, which makes it a fun read. It's almost like a movie. But more importantly, this is a great business book. To the point, if I ran a, a Detroit three car company, I would order all my top execs to read this thing because it's about how a conservative, essentially family business, so it is publicly traded, but but with the culture of family business with patriarchs forced a uh, faced a revolution and not only survived it, but prospered, which is happens to about one out of 30 big businesses when this happens. So th- this is, it, it, you know, the New York Times stuff is important. It's an important institution. I've got I used to call Adam, you remember and complain all the time about what kind of left-wing crap in a campaign. Your premise is always Democratic. You don't have a Republican primary voter on the payroll there, except in the circulation department, moving heaven out. Yeah. But (laughs) as a business story about survival and strategy and company culture, it, it it is a vital read. So anybody... Uh, who's in an industry, which is almost everything now with with digital commerce, uh, undergoing revolution, read this book because it's a survival guide to something that is much more likely to wipe you out in the next five to 10 years than than let you uh, do well. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sitting here in Chicago watching the life being being squeezed out of the newspaper, at which I was reared, not just which I read, but where I worked, the Chicago Tribune. Uh, and all across this country, we've seen the decline of local journalism uh, platforms uh, as the as as the internet destroyed the base of uh, of newspaper revenues, and you know th- that has implications for democracy, Adam. Uh, so the Times story is a happy story. the The rest of the story is very much up in the air as to how local news gets covered in this country uh, in a digital age. And I don't think anybody's really fully cracked that code yet. Yeah, I'm not even sure it's up in the air. I think it's, as you said, in Chicago, in cities across the country, small communities, these newspapers are just dying or cutting newsrooms like, look at Gannett, right? You know, say, cutting newsrooms like crazy. And it has a huge cost in terms of coverage of state houses, city halls, local police departments. It's a big, big deal. And I think it also that, helps nationalize our politics because people does. aren't getting local That's coverage. That's a great point. Yeah. That's right. And we, we feed, you know, one of the business decisions that the, that the newspaper Times made was to become a national and now an international newspaper, right? So, I mean, I think last I checked, the New York Times has more subscribers in California than it does in New York, right? And they're expanding, 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 which means they're less focused on. New York or Chicago or Boston. Right. And it's a big loss. I don't know what the answer to that is. I know that people are really struggling with it and trying to figure it out, but it's really a little bit alarming. And they went lifestyle, which was, you know, controversial, but now wire cutter and there's a lot of stuff there. I mean, I'll never forget the best job to go back to my favorite theme. Remember the old Ron Howard picture, the paper, which was kind of about the scrappy tabloids. They have Spalding Gray playing the editor of their fictional New York Times. And the big headline is Nepal premier will not resign. (laughs) And that was kind of the old New York Times. I remember when when I was in the editorial board there with McCain in 2000 and McCain and I were in a waiting room looking at all the oak and everything. And it's all super polite. And I said, John, I hope you're ready. You know, they conduct these things in French, the language of civilized diplomacy, you know, They almost did. They almost switched into. So the, the, the Times has allowed itself to evolve, to have wider repeal, uh, which has made it such a digital powerhouse. And podcasting, they've done that well. So 
Uh, anyway, it's a very instructive and important book. I, I had my I had I had my own experience uh, with a presidential endorsement <laughs> session at the uh, Times with Obama in two thousand and eight, which I Adam probably knows, but I won't share uh, here. But uh, Adam, when you took this on, when you took this on, you work at the New York Times. Yeah, that's right. You still work there. Yes. Now, yeah. now that they've read we'll, it. We'll check after this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We've ruined many careers, Adam. Don't worry about it. <laughs> you could be a professional hack. Talk about the pressures of writing about the institution. Now, it was Gay, Tal- Gay Talese was gone from the Times Gay by Talese the time. Gay Talese left when he wrote yes. his book. Yeah. And I, I thought a lot about whether to leave um, for all the obvious reasons. I decided to stay, partly because I'm not sure I could have pulled off... Um, writing a book like this financially, but I didn't keep working there. The way I dealt with Plus this... Plus, you love working for the Times. I love working for the Times. I spent my whole life wanting to work there. So th- they was, you're right. That would have been really painful. The book is focused on, almost exclusively, on people who are gone, right? All the players, with two exceptions, have retired or died. I mean, they're just gone. So it's a book about history. I think that if I was writing in depth about post-2016... Um, I think it would have been really complicated. I like to go into the office and see people who I just wrote about skeptically or meanly <laughs> would have been really uncomfortable. Um, but generally speaking, uh, with two exceptions, which I'll tell you, there everyone I write about or look at has retired or moved on, which helps in terms of my detachment. Not as a I result hope. of what you wrote, right? No, hopefully not. <laughs> but also, like, as David, as you know, when you talk to people about their past, they're more likely to be candid and reflective. And also I had access to all kinds of documents and papers going back 40 years that were, in my opinion, essential to telling the story. And that's much more difficult post-2016, both because of email, there's less documents, because people aren't going to share them. You know, so it's 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 complicated. Um, I write about in the book the earlier stages of the career of Arthur Greg Salzberger, who is now the publisher. I don't really talk about him as publisher. I think that's a great book to do at some point. And Mm -hmm. the other one is Carolyn Ryan, who who I think you know, who is now a managing editor who was, you know, one of the players in some of the stories I talk about, but not not sort of central to the news show that I write about at the time. Yeah, she is yeah. now. And a political editor of the Times the old days I never hated. <laughs> yeah, I always thought she was very yeah. fair. Yeah. And that's and that's saying something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, that's high something. praise. Yeah. Yeah. Well listen, it's a great book. I know Thank how you. much you labored to make it such and you brought to it the same degree of assiduous reporting that you've brought to your political writing, sometimes to my delight and sometimes to my few <laughs> complete despair. <laughs> but we'll have to get the Clinton guys on. They'll do a three hour episode about all that. But go on and buy it. What's the title one more time? Available on Amazon. It's called uh, The Times How the Newspaper Records Survive Scandal, Scorn, and the transformation of journalism. I'll say one thing in defense. I know it's really long, but it really does capture the subtitle. It does. Really does. That's yeah. it. Like someone's asked me what the book's about. That's it. Murphy Murphy, and I would tell you that in that a good tagline is one that perfectly distills the message. And, oh, okay. Uh, and so that, you, it does. that, that yeah, does it, perfectly it distill the message of this book. So if that title, brilliant as it is, is too long, hey, don't worry about it. Just go to hacksontap.com slash book club, one word, book club. And you've got all the great books that we love there, led by this wonderful tome from Adam McGurney. Okay, let's take a break right here for a word from our sponsor, and we'll be right back. Reproductive Medicine Associates commercial, take one. RMA is a fertility center where next level science and proven treatment plans Turn big dreams into big reality. Realities like me. Start your fertility journey today. Learn more at rmanetwork.com. Honey, where'd you go in your pajamas? (sighs) Sleepwalking. Again? How far? My watch says... 25 miles. 25? Did you know we can save up to 25% off grocery store prices at BJ's Wholesale Club? We can save a ton for our holiday party. You already did. Huh? There's deli platters, candy, and baking ingredients on the table. I bought that? Yeah, you've been sleep shopping. So it's true. Saving at BJ's is so easy, you can do it in your sleep. Save in club or on BJ's.com. Not a member? Join today. BJ's. Absurdly simple savings.
If you have a question for the hacks, all you have to do is email us at hacksontap at gmail.com, hacksontap at gmail.com. But if you're too damn lazy to do that, we now have a call-in number, and I'm going to give the number to you. It's a little hard, uh, so we're going to do it twice, and I'm going to use this moment to show off my newly learned skills of ventriloquism. I am now 321 drinking a glass of water. Glug, glug, glug. 773-389-4471. See, there you go. I'll repeat it because who can remember that? 773-389-4471. All right, great. We got the low bid on the number clearly. So Was that AI, Mike? That sounded like AI. Yeah, yeah, it was. I've been replaced years ago. And the AI keeps saying, watch Haley. Uh, Don't make a long speech. That's Axelrod in my job. We had to fire the AI because last spring the ai was saying trump is fading this thing is falling yeah, apart yeah, exactly so we got rid of him and we got the, the old coot back here instead so um anyway wisdom wisdom all right so give us about a 20 second message we do the bloviating so keep it short and mention your name so we can give you credit so just leave it on the voicemail there at the off track betting parlor in chicago that we run this place out of all right we now have our famous mailbag mike carey a lifelong Iowa Democrat has a question for you. Hey, Hacks, this is Carrie. As a lifelong Iowa Democrat who's extremely concerned about the possible fall of democracy, what would you say is the best strategic play when it comes to the Iowa caucuses? Do we do I hold my nose and register temporarily as a Republican and vote for a semi-viable, non-crazy candidate like Haley? Or should we stay home and let the base do their thing, knowing that Trump has lost almost every election he's touched in, he's touched in the last few years? What would you do? Thanks, guys. Love the show. Well, thank you, Carrie. Thank you for listening and for that excellent question. So you are representative of what I think is the biggest missed story so far, the Iowa caucus. As you know, as an Iowan, it's culturally important there because Iowa has a huge voice in this. And we're at a critical time where democracy is at stake. So there are 170,000 Iowans like you who voted, and uh, Democrats and independents who decided to be in the Democratic contest who voted in the last caucus. But now the caucus has been canceled for, in my view, silly reasons. So you're used to getting out and making your voice heard. I would encourage you to do it again. If you're an independent, you can go to the caucus. You can also go online and become a Republican for a few weeks. Believe me, it won't kill you. I've been voting Democrat a bit now, and I'm I'm doing just fine. So I would encourage you to follow your instincts and vote for democracy. And, you know, I would vote for Haley as the best chance to stop Trump. And again, I'm not crazy for Haley. I know her. I think she's too cynical. But compared to Trump, she's Gandhi. So I would I would be a patriot. You can always go back in the general election and vote, you know, your side or who you want to win. But Iowa should not be muted. And there are 170,000 good Iowa Democrats and independents who I think owe the country participation. So I would encourage you to do that online. This isn't the big unwritten story of the Iowa caucuses yet, but it may be after the Iowa caucuses, because the history of this is that there's very little crossover. But as you point out, there also was a uh, there was a Democratic nominating. uh, There was there were Democratic caucuses as well to compete. So uh, it'll be interesting to watch the place where there is. Uh, a history of of independent voters voting in one primary or the other is in New Hampshire. And, and Mike, I was thinking numbers. about this the other day because you yeah. were there uh, in in two thousand. You know, I'm thinking about this bill of goods that poor Dean Phillips was sold uh, to get into the race in 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 two thousand. Bill Bradley was running against Al Gore. He was counting on a win in New Hampshire, and the Republican campaign that you ran there became so compelling for John McCain that the independents flowed into the Republican primary to vote for McCain and Gore beat Bradley in the uh, in, and remember you and Bradley had a debate yeah which I think ended up uh, helping uh, helping McCain so uh, it, it, it there'll be ancillary effects in in uh, in New Hampshire of crossover voting. Okay, I've got one for Adam Nagurney from Ari, uh, who says, I've I've seen multiple polls showing that younger voters widely disapprove of Biden's handling of the Israel-Palestine conflict, and his overall approval rating has seemingly suffered as a result. 
How much of a long-term impact do you think that this conflict will have? And how much should Biden be worrying about this conflict potentially lowering turnout among younger progressive voters? That's a really good question. Thank you, Ari, for it. You know, it's an issue. It's one of the many problems that I think uh, President Biden has. On the other hand, at some point, it's going to become a comparison. And I'm not sure there's going to be that much of a difference between President Biden and and former President Trump on Israel and backing Israel during this. So once the election becomes a choice, it's less of a factor. The one caveat I would add here is that generally one of the challenges that Biden has here, and I think largely because of his age, is lack of enthusiasm among younger voters. Um, I think that's really clear. And I think he needs to deal with it if he wants to win next November. This is just one part of it. And I, I'm not even sure this is the most serious part of it that he is facing. Again, because elections are choices. This is one where the comparative is really, really important, the contrast between Biden and Trump. I mean, just think about what Trump would be telling Bibi Netanyahu now, where Biden has been uh, uh, very, very instrumental in pushing for these strategic pauses, in pushing for these hostage uh, releases, uh, in pushing for humanitarian aid. Uh, I suspect because this this is would follow his pattern. Trump would have just given PB Netanyahu a green light and would not bomb, have pressured bomb, him, bomb, right? And would not have been a useful uh, in, interlocutor uh, when it came to trying to um, uh, deal with uh, negotiations to get these hostages uh, out. Hey, Murphy, you have one for me. I do, I do, from the amazing and insightful Lucci. And I'm going to do this one Karnak style after the old Johnny Carson Tonight <laughs> Show. All right, here it is. I'm holding the card Murphy's to my references head. are all from the, se- the s- <laughs> 60s and 70s, but go I ahead. I haven't thought of Karnak in 30 years. <laughs> well, I, I want the president to understand them. I should really go back to the Dumont <laughs> Network and Vaudeville. Yeah, Clarence the Talking <laughs> Mule, Mr. President, that's communicating. All right, I've got the card in my forehead. The answer... More Gina Raimundo. And here's the question from Lucy. (laughs) Instead of campaigning for a Biden presidency in 2024, why not campaign for a Democratic administration like they do in the parliamentary governments like in the United Kingdom? Remove Biden from the narrative since it's his age that people have an issue with. And the fact is, if something happens to him, a Democratic administration will continue. Would that work for him? You know, I know what Mike's referring to. He's been arguing and I think compellingly that the uh, that that the Biden campaign youths should be using surrogates and the cabinet much more uh, aggressively than they have than they have so far. And I agree with that because he's not the best messenger. But we don't have a system. We don't have a parliamentary system. Parties generally are defined by their uh by their leader, the presidential candidate, not the other way uh, around. And so, the, you know, there there is limited utility uh, to that. Again, I think that the uh, that uh, the most important thing is to really give um, uh, give prominence to not just the things that Biden has fought for and is fighting for, but the things that Trump has fought for, which is primarily Trump and uh, what he would represent and really strike a very, very strong contrast, because this will be uh, as stark a choice as we've ever faced. It is a choice between two older men, and the question is, who has his eye on the future and who represents fundamental American values and, and who doesn't. I agree with that on the big picture. I just think they've got stars. they got Mitch Landrew. they got Pete Buttigieg. I think the Biden people are almost... In and out, Mike. In and out of the administration. You've got right, all these right. governors they're, they're... who are great, compelling. And by the way, they're not being used. They're not being used. No, I think by design. Because I think the Biden guys think, well, we're look old with all these young stars running around. I'll give you lost the old battle. I agree with you on the big contrast. And I'd say one more thing. One of the great old slogans in advertising is don't sell the drill, sell the hole it makes. What are the two outcomes? What's life going to be like a year into Trump presidency versus a Biden one? What do you get? Move the spotlight to your life and whose side people are on and away from well, who's older and crazier because they're going to lose the old thing. There's yeah, no winning. side it. people are, I think, is a really important contrast. And that work, you know, that 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 was how Obama won in 2012. I think it's how uh 
how Biden can win. Well, in, and it's uh, easier because it's pre-baked for all Biden's problems. And he has many. It's easy to convince people that it is true that Trump is on his own side and nobody else's. Yeah. And Trump makes that case every day. So bottle it. They should have a Manhattan Project going on right now to really, really drill deep into the concerns that people have about Trump. Yeah, they, they have Manhattans, them. all right. They're drinking them every day, looking at the polling numbers. <laughs> I, don't, I think the project part is where they're having trouble. But with that, a huge thank you. I thought you they were drinking to, old fashions, man. Well, I didn't know I, that they were drinking Manhattans. Hey, Adam Nagurney, it's such a pleasure to be with you and to uh, our listeners. Adam, who is the uh, who, who is out on the West Coast for the New York Times, is also uh, going to be uh, covering this campaign and providing uh, sort of uh, perspective pieces on this campaign based on the experience of having covered more presidential elections than uh, than many and uh, great wisdom. Yeah, I think I you... met you on the first Dole campaign in 88. So we're, we're dealing with seasoned right. veteran yeah. here. Yeah, I think that's right. I think it was Humphrey Nixon for me. Yeah. But, uh, anyway. I think it was Eisenhower. <laughs> you, were do, you were doing Stevenson, that Illinois guy. Yeah, yeah, it was John Adams for President Biden. But ha ha, here all week. Always great to see you, brother. And Thank come you. back Thank again. You, and great, great good luck with the, the wonderful book you've Tremendous written. Tremendous book. Lessons on every dimension. All right. Take care, everybody. I'll see you X. Take care. Okay, Adam. see you next week. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. Bye-bye. Total by Verizon is wireless that goes all in for you. That means unlimited 5G data powered by Verizon. Priced by us, just $25 a line for four lines on the unlimited plan. Plus, no contracts and no credit checks. Because it can't be total unless it's all in. Find a store and exclusive deals at totalbyverizon.com slash stores. Monthly rate when you activate with auto pay plus taxes and fees. Additional restrictions apply. See website for data management practices and full terms. Discover, this is Daniela. Hi, it's Jennifer Coolidge. I just want to thank you for making me feel so special. I earned cash back on debit for my dinner party groceries. That's great. But with Discover Cashback Debit, we give everyone cash back on everyday purchases. Anything else I can help you with? Do you like asparagus and mushroom sorbet? I've got leftovers. Introducing Discover Cashback Debit, a checking account with cash back. It pays to Discover. Eligibility in terms at discover.com slash cashback debit. Discover Bank, member FDIC.